I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space. I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I got to do is breathe underwater. As we know, Admiral Nelson designed the sea view from the ground up. He's also been known to inspect other subs since he's kind of an expert. In fact, he may have designed this one. There are a few subtle clues that could suggest it. Charles, sluggish. Guidance okay. Oil temperature's 20 degrees high. Captain, I suggest you rig a hose, get a constant spray of water on the port propeller shaft bearings. Aye, Admiral. Shall I decrease speed? Well, there's no reason to. If she's gonna burn out, there's no better time than on a shakedown cruise. We all heard him call this a shakedown cruise. That's the water equivalent of a test drive. For a submarine that sometimes calls for surface ships to track its location and monitor for any issues. With nuclear submarines, that's not always the case. In 1960, the USS Triton went clear around the world underwater on its shakedown cruise. So, as a rule, the situation is adjusted to fit the needs of the boat. At the very least, everybody knows their position, course, and speed so that if something does happen, we know where to find them. You ever see that before, Jim? Never. Neither have I. Let's have a look at sonar. Interference. Lots of it, Captain. Any indication of its source? Whatever it is, we're in the center of it. Gyro compass deviating 170 degrees. Check for malfunction. Some kind of a force field. Radio our position to Comsub Pack. Jones, radio our position to Comsub Pack. Our current position is we just ran into something. But it's worse than just some kind of interference with their systems. Pathometers show we're above a mountain range. Peaks 300 feet, hollows 36,000 feet. An uncharted area. Deep within the Marianas Trench. With mountains higher than Mount Everest. Interference dead ahead. Affecting guidance control, Captain. Yes. Up, periscope. Calentura. Calentura, more properly Calenterata, is a broad classification that includes most sea jellies as well as communal creatures like sea pens. The captain is saying these are some kind of jelly-like creatures, but he doesn't know more than that, so he used a generalized word for them. There are millions upon millions of them, which the captain says he's never seen before. I don't know about the number they're seeing here, but I've been diving in the Monterey area when an entire bay was practically choked with moon jellies. Seeing where we were going while swimming through them was a bit of a chore. The good thing about that is moon jellies are harmless. Oh, they have the stingers, known as pneumatocysts, in their tendrils, but their potency is so low a human can't even feel it. I have a feeling these guys aren't so harmless. They're gone. We're picking up a lot of electromagnetic radiation from those mountains, Captain. Electromagnetic radiation. I'd give a lot to have core samples. All stop. Aye, sir. Aye, Admiral. It'll give me time to check guidance controls. Paula, get ready for a diving mission. You're going to be the Admiral's diving buddy. The Admiral and Fowler will head out with lights, metal detectors, and tools to grab some rock samples. They may be a little too focused on the rocks because something important is happening back at the sub. Guidance control malfunctioning, Captain. Blow all ballast groups. Can't blow ballast. No response from compressors. Remember all those Calenterata you saw? I think we found their great-grandpappy. Meanwhile, Nelson and Fowler have finished gathering their samples and are on their way back to... That. 
For those who don't know, sea jellies, or jellyfish if you simply must, don't have a brain. They have a minimal central nervous system that's strong enough to keep them alive, and that's about it. They don't swim, they drift. They don't have a way to control where the water takes them, so they just hang around, literally and figuratively, and wait for something to wander into those tentacles. Once the critter is stunned, the automatic systems take over and the tentacles draw the prey toward the main body. The jelly will start exuding digestive juices to dissolve the animal's flesh and it gets absorbed from there. Now here's the thing. The tentacles can't tell the difference between food and flotsam, so if the absorbing bodies in the jelly aren't getting any nourishment, it'll let go because it doesn't have time to waste trying to eat driftwood or whatever. So as quick as this thing gets the Neptune up to its mantle, it should spit it out because that thing can't taste good. Before anybody asks, I don't know. Why that happened will never be explained. I can't see any good reason for it unless Nelson built the outer hull out of fish guts. He and Fowler will surface right in the middle of that huge swarm they saw earlier. No, Fowler! Our only chance is to keep our heads. With these things stinging us? With that down there? If we don't get out of this water soon, it won't last long. Get out of the water. Slip out of your wetsuit. But whatever you do, don't lose your air tanks. Don't take your suit off, dummy. It's the only thing protecting you from those things. If Fowler is any indication, they're stinging him right through his wetsuit, which I'm sorry doesn't happen. We're trying to hint that they've gotten inside his suit, but that also doesn't happen. Really, this episode already lost me several ways. That's just one more. But there's a method to Nelson's foolishness. Using some line that Fowler has, they tie off the openings in the wetsuits, tie them together and inflate them from the air tanks, and presto changeo, we have a raft. Now they just need somebody to come find them. Jackson, on a double, Jackson. Yes, sir. What's the meaning of this? Seventh Fleet cannot locate Neptune. It means they can't find the Neptune, Admiral. I thought that was pretty clear. We know our position. They're not looking. It's been only 12 hours. Only 12 hours? That sub should have been located and the survivors picked up by now. And the hole they fell into is only 36,000 feet deep. Piece of cake, right? Be prepared to thoroughly dislike this guy. Harold J. Stone made a career out of playing characters like this one. He took advantage of his intimidating size and looks and had steady work for most of his life. His birth name was Hochstein, which means high stone in German, so adopting the stage name Stone was sort of a natural progression, since as a general rule, an actor likes to have dumb Americans be able to pronounce his name. Most Americans can't pronounce a genuinely German name without drooling, so... He did us a favor. Captain Crane just arrived, hoping for news about Admiral Nelson. Weather, South Pacific area. I can read, Commander. Sorry, sir. Ralph! <laughs> Did anybody see what kind of bug crawled up his butt? Out on the ocean, Nelson and Fowler are using their fins to paddle toward the nearest shipping lanes and using their remaining rope to catch fish. A massive search is on, but they're looking for something about this big in a body of water that covers half the planet. Bring her around to port. Aye, sir. Port? Oh. Oh. Over there, Fowler. Are we going to come out of this? I mean, are we going to make it, sir? <laughs> We've been pretty lucky so far. And needless to say, they've had to call off the search until that storm passes. Fowler isn't doing so well. Did you 
you swallow the Neptune? I never heard of anything that big, sir. It's not a single creature. It's a whole system of creatures organized into one giant. But that big, sir? Something in the force field must have stimulated its ability to grow. I won't know until I go back. Not me. I won't go back for anything. No, sir. I'm with Fowler. That thing can have that part of the ocean. I'm delighted to stay out of its way. There must be something we can do. This not knowing. What can you do? The Neptune went down 6,000 miles from here. There must be something. Why? Men have gone down with their ships for hundreds of years. Good men. Brave ones. Men like Nelson and the crew of the Neptune. And there was nothing anyone could do. Don't they teach it anymore at the Naval Academy? I assume they do, but they don't teach you that you have to just shrug and accept it before you know that's what happened. We're beginning to see a little bit of what the Admiral's problem is. Poor Fowler, we hardly knew you. In fact, we didn't knew you. Captain Crane is back on the sea view. They're in port right now, and he's getting a call from Admiral Stark. Yes, Admiral. Yes, sir, any word? I just received instructions from the Secretary of Defense to place a sea view in temporary commission with orders to investigate the loss of the Neptune. Then there's no word. If there had been, I would have told you. Well, Commander, I'll the sea view and give you my orders. Yes, sir. Oh, and Commander, I run a tight ship. Old Navy, spit polish in the brig. Tell your men. Yes, sir. I foresee trouble. Fire one. Fire one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One fired. Seven seconds. Two seconds too long. Sloppy drill, Captain. Torpedo Chief, you'll be a seaman if you don't move faster than that. Yes, sir. This guy does not get it. The Sea View isn't a warship. It's a research vessel, and its crew consists of research specialists, not gung-ho fighters. This is not a Navy ship, Admiral. What's that? Let up on the men, Admiral. You've been on them for days. I don't run an old Navy spit polish and brig ship. I was new Navy. So were my men. And so was Admiral Nelson. You're forgetting that this ship is on active status now, Captain. And he and the men have been doing civilian work for months, if not years. It takes a special kind of arrogance to expect them to suddenly snap to and do everything totally different just because he can't let go of the past. Captain! Captain! Yes, Sparks? A call for you, Captain. The call is the last thing they expected. Or, more accurately, it's from the last person they expected to hear from. Admiral, is that you? Yes, Lee. Lee. Yes, Admiral. On your way to the Neptune, stop by the Honolulu Naval Hospital and pick me up, huh? <sighs> aye, aye, sir. They can't wait for you to get back here and send this other guy home. <laughs> I hear Jig Stark has taken over the sea view. Just till you get aboard, you old pirate. Then you're back on temporary duty yourself. <laughs> I've been trying to pound some Navy discipline into this crew of yours. Well, uh, let's just keep relaxed, huh, Jix? Uh, sure, Harriman. See you in a couple of days. Stark quickly covered the microphone, leaned over to Captain Crane and said, Do you happen to have a dictionary nearby? No, Fowler's mind was completely gone. He was haunted by the Solentrate and his buddies aboard the Neptune. <laughs> What's the matter, Lee? You look like you lost your best friend. You know, the Neptune might have had a fight of it, which you could have maneuvered, but the control circuits were shorted out, and she was helpless. And the captain did not blow ballast. I saw that. And she, she lost maneuvering speed. Let's go, Lee. Oh, I forgot to put me on cortisone. Maybe he should take about half as much of it because he's talking like he's on meth. Steroids can have that effect on some people, but I get the feeling nobody's paying attention. 
Thanks. Glad to have you back aboard, Admiral. Sure is, Admiral. Someone I'd rather turn command over to, Harriman. Captain Crane is in command of the Sea View. Well, not while she's in the Navy, and there are two admirals aboard. Even though one of those admirals is only at about half strength, and the other one knows diddly squat about the boat. I really hope Crane ends up backhanding this guy, and Nelson backs him up. Right, Captain. Let's get underway, Lee. Of those two admirals, that one has both the seniority and the level of knowledge, so if he says Crane is in command, Crane is in command, and the other admiral needs to be put in his place. Too bad nobody will do it. The sooner this mission is accomplished, the sooner we become civilians again. He's eating those things like they're candy. I don't see how that can be good for him. No, no, Jiggs. I'm certain there was neither captain nor crew error. But the Neptune's control circuit shorted out. She had to rely on manual controls. Mm, and she couldn't respond fast enough to the emergency. I'll buy that. Yeah, to one emergency, perhaps, but not to both the force dive and the cylinderate. Mm. Tell me more about this creature, Harriman. Well, it's, it's not just one creature, Jiggs. It's, it's millions of creatures, all combined to form one central organism. Like a Portuguese man of war. Exactly. The, uh, Stark finds the whole thing hard to believe. A thousand feet across. A thousand feet across? Oh, why not? I would speculate that the radioactive energy of the force field has stimulated this organism's ability to combine. It could go to two, three, even four times its present size in time. Oh, calm now. You've been adrift too long, Harriman. Isn't it possible you're exaggerating? He saw it, Stark. You didn't. Maybe you should shut up and listen to him. Admiral Nelson doesn't exaggerate. You see, it's like the sea view, Admiral. Now all of us, the crew, you and I. Now inside, we're like individuals. But outside, we're like one big creature. Precisely, Lee. I'm still not convinced he gets it, so all they can do is try to work around him and get this done in spite of him. Now, here we are, Chip. Now check out this line right here from this point on aft. Right. Crane, can I see you a minute? Yes, sir. Carry on, Chip. Give me a full report. You're lax, sir. You show a definite tendency toward an easy informality that makes for a loose ship. Why, uh, just now I heard you address your exec uh, by his first name. He did no such thing. He called him by a nickname that he's probably had since birth. If you really think someone would name their kid Chip, your cruel streak is bigger than I thought. Hey, yes, sir. Chip and I are good friends. When I give him orders in front of the crew, I call him Mr. Morton. Alone, I use his first name. Now, unless I've received bad instruction at Annapolis, I believe it's up to the captain to set the attitude of the ship's company, especially aboard a submarine. I consider your answer insubordinate, Commander. Captain Crane, will you please join Admiral Nelson in the control room at once? By your leave, Admiral. Remember, there's two admirals here, and only one of them actually knows how to run the boat. Now, here's the part you don't like. It's the other guy. Christmas train will have to him the the same way. Some electrical interference, Captain. Gyro compass deviation 100 degrees. The range from 300 feet to 36,000 feet. Incredible. The Neptune sank right there. Take it on me. So now. Keep a look for any large, dense mass. Aye, sir. If he had all his faculties, he'd turn command over to Crane. But we know if he tried to do that, Stark would insist on being in command because he has stars on his collar. Having some clue what to do is secondary to rank, as we all know. And by the way, they just ran into the same rocks that the Neptune did, and for the same reason. Interference affecting guidance control, Captain. We're sinking, Captain! Just like the Neptune, they can't restore control and they can't blow ballast tanks. Are the compressors still out? Yes, sir. We can't blow ballast. Gyro control's gone. Guidance control's inoperative. Captain.
We'll try steering by the engines, Mr. Morton. Engine room. Port engines ahead one third. Starboard engines back one third. That's giving them a small measure of control. The only thing they can do is find a plateau on this sea mount big enough to set the sea view down so they can make repairs. Captain Crane just found one and is settling the boat onto it. All right, here we go. Go fast. Admiral Stark, brace yourself. Notice the Admiral. Me man, me make stick. Me no need hold on. Me man, me make stick. Dangerous maneuver, Captain. Dangerous. Obviously, Admiral, you didn't hear my order to stand fast. You may need to make a new stick, Admiral Manly Man. While they're having a stare down, Nelson has been doodling on a piece of paper, and he thinks he's figured this out. I suspect a large vein of carnitide ore. Send divers out to get a core sample. And me. Yes, Admiral. Have them hurry. We're all vulnerable. What did I tell you, Jiggs? Crane's the best there is. So go polish your spit. Now he's excited. Carnitite is a kind of uranium ore, which means more stuff to build great big bombs. If it is carnitite, Stark wants it. A pair of divers will take samples and bring them back. That's not all they brought back. Admiral. Yes? What kind of radioactivity? Electroactive. All right, boys, get down to sick bay. This radiation is powerful enough to destroy brain cells. Electroactive radiation? I don't know what it means either, Admiral. Fowler was attacked by the Salantrids just before he got aboard the raft. That's probably what killed him. Then I suggest you get them off that other guy quicker than this. They need a way to get up to maneuvering speed when they can't use their ballast tanks. Captain Crane and Mr. Morton have been feeding their dilemma into the computer, and it's come up with a solution that nobody saw coming. More than that, nobody can believe it. Now, once we get off this plateau, we'll go straight down. Unless we can pick up enough speed to maneuver. How are you going to do that? Mm, according to the computer, our only solution is to dive. Dive? They have to get to within 50 feet of crush depth and reach a speed of 32.9 knots, then reverse the planes and pull up. NASA calls it a gravity assist, but NASA doesn't have to think about where crush depth is, because in space, if you don't do it right, it's all crush depth, or whatever the opposite of that is. Chip, does the, um, does the Admiral seem different to you? I mean, uh, have you noticed anything? What do you mean? Well, uh, when he, um... Hey! It was counter-tight! I guess I've lost my touch. Let's blow ballast and get out of here. We can't blow our ballast tanks. He told the Admiral that when it happened. Morton knows that, so there's an example of being different. Admiral, we should put a full down angle on the planes and dive. Down angle? Lee, have you taken leave of your senses? Put a full up angle on the planes, I'll head full. Well, what about the computer report? Hang the computer! I designed this submarine, I know how she works! Is that different enough for you, Chip? Unfortunately, when Crane protests, dueling admirals relieve him of command. Finally, Stark orders Morton to escort the captain to his cabin. Morton is kind of stuck. No. This ship is my responsibility. Lee, don't. Mutiny is a hanging offense, Captain. Before you can hang me, I'm going to get this ship home. Full down angle on all planes. All ahead flank. Aye, sir. Captain. Lee. I don't have any other choice. All ahead, flank! No. 
Please don't. Neither of them fully understands what's going on with their systems. Stark has been too busy asserting his authority, and Nelson is out there like the Andromeda Galaxy. Even after the maneuver works and they start going up, he can't let go of it. Mr. Morton, you command the sea view. Send a course for home. Yes, sir. <laughs> Take, however, temporarily. This was a Navy ship when Captain Crane mutinied. I demanded general court-martial. But he was right. He saved this ship in all hands. Admiral Stark is starting to realize there's something seriously wrong with his old friend. Harriman, I think we should go to your cabin. <laughs> you, you were right, Jakes. Right, you were right. Sea View is a new ship, a mutinous ship. Mutineers, all of you. If Richard Bass Hart didn't get Boku Awards for this performance, there's no justice in the world. Lots of you have told me how much you always loved him, and this right here is why. He's not Richard Bass Hart, he's Admiral Harriman Nelson currently out of his mind. The really scary part is, there's a good chance it's caused by that brain cell destroying radiation. We all know what that means, so I won't say it. Come in. Captain, the diver's dead. Dead? He went out of his mind, sank into a coma. And... Well, what was the cause of death? I found his head covered with cilantro. They emitted electric radiation, powerful enough to completely destroy the brain cells. Let's see, who else has been out there among those things lately? No, mm, oh, it'll come to me eventually. Well, what about the other diver? He doesn't seem to have any signs of radiation, but he may develop symptoms days, even weeks later. Symptoms? What kind of symptoms? Personality changes at first, like allergies to certain drugs. The symptoms are talkativeness, followed by depression, irritability, and just before the coma, there may be a violent episode. I have a feeling the doctor knows who he just described. And then? Unlike drug reactions, which are reversible, irradiated brain cells are always fatal. No. Control room. What is it? The Selenerate, Captain. Sonar's picked it up. It's closing in on us. Not only are we seeing a stellar performance from Richard Basehart, that right there was some of the most skillful writing I've seen in decades. I'll explain why later. Doc, take care of the Admiral. Stations. All right, pull yourselves together. Stand by for orders. Aye, sir. We watched the Calentra start to envelop the sea view the same way it did the Neptune. But unlike the Neptune's captain, Crane knows what he's dealing with. Reactor room. Stand by to bring the reactors up to full power. We're going to hit the Solentorate with an electrical charge. Ready the attack generators. Take a look, Admiral. He doesn't want the Admiral looking at him. The Admiral's mean. Fire one. Fire one. Fire two. Fire two. Fire three. If you haven't noticed, the Admiral is standing a respectful distance off and staying out of the way. He finally figured out that Crane is a lot smarter than he is. I didn't show it, but he was looking through the periscope and Crane gently said, Excuse me. Stark stepped aside and actually said, Of course, Captain. Took him long enough. Fire four! Fire four! <laughs>
The first time I watched this, I said, oh, come on, loud enough to be heard up the block. It just disappears. Then I realized, no, it didn't disappear. It disintegrated into its component parts, which are about yay big based on what we saw on that diver's neck. Some kind of dissipating cloud might have been nice, but you could only do so much with 60s technology. Now the only question is, can anything be done for Admiral Nelson? How is he? Resting. Have you examined him? Yes, thoroughly. And? Physically, he's in fine shape. His brain cells, are they damaged? No. He had an allergic reaction. Throw these away, and he'll be as good as new. I wasn't able to find any such allergic reaction to cortisone. The only recorded allergies involve good old anaphylaxis. And now that that's out of the way, remember when I said that was some of the best writing I've seen since I don't know when? Way back there, we got two huge clues and didn't realize it. Like allergies to certain drugs. Unlike drug reactions, which are reversible. He told us what the big reveal was going to be, twice, and they went right past us because we weren't expecting anything. That's how the best mystery writers plant clues, and these are right up there with them. If you can get past the giant monster, whatever it was, I hesitate to try and compare it with anything I'm familiar with because, yeah. Anyway, if you can get past that and the idea of a trench 10,000 feet deeper than the Marianas Trench and nobody's noticed it before, this is an incredible episode. I don't have a problem with either of those things because we haven't even explored 10% of the oceans. We have no idea what's down there and things like our sonar and ROVs can only reach so far with the technology we have at the moment. Now imagine you're in 1966 pretending it's 1975 and you have to try and second guess how much exploration has been done during that time gap. I also understand why they called it mutiny. I'm not sure how many people would have tuned in to see an episode called Big Honkin' Jellyfish. I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space. I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I gotta do is breathe underwater. In Monterey area, in the Monterey, read the line, David, while swimming through where we were going while swimming through them. But their potenty is... Potenty? Nelson bit the... Bit, 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 bit. Piece of cake, right? Yeah! Right! We recorded allergies... Al allergies? Allergies? A big honking jellyfish. Jellyfish? All that, and then I blow an easy word. <laughs>